Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening. Uh, hello everybody. I'm Pringo Dikdo Nugroho. I'm a nephrologist at uh, Dr. Cipto Mangun Kusumo Hospital. And uh, I'm acting uh, now as a General Secretary of Indonesia Society of Nephrology. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to moderate this webinar today with our esteemed panelists on uh, peritoneal dialysis. Uh, now, uh, our webinar is a collaboration of International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis uh, and Indonesia Society of uh, Nephrologists. Uh, it our fortunate to have a collaboration with International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, and we will hear a speech from uh, International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis. I give uh, Isaac uh, to the floor. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Isaac Teitelbaum. I am the chair of the International Liaison Committee of the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis. It is my pleasure, together with Dr. Scott Liebman, who is chair of the Education Committee of the Society, to help bring to you this series of webinars that we are hoping to conduct over the next seven weeks or so, one today, one, I believe, on August 3rd, and the last one, if I'm not mistaken, it's on August 31st. For today, we have uh, three talks dealing with the, the very basics of how to get started with peritoneal dialysis, one on how to choose, why to choose PD in the first place, and then two talks about catheter insertion, one on the general theory, and the third one on your local experience. So. Without further ado, I, I wanted to thank a gentleman who's going to stay in the background, Mr. Miguel Gallardo, who is the administrator for ISPD, who has facilitated um, creating this webinar series. And uh, um, I'm not going to be able to stay with you throughout, but I, I wish you good luck. And I hope that by introducing this webinar series, we may in fact enable you to increase your utilization of peritoneal dialysis in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac, for the opening speech. Uh, I will give a short presentation on ethics uh, because it is obligation from the uh, Indonesian Medical Association. Uh, let me share my slide. Yeah, uh, I will talk in Indonesia for Indonesian uh, attendees. Uh, as we know that, uh, seperti kita tahu bahwa dari dialisis ini ada beberapa aspek etik yang kita perlu perhatikan. Ya, kita saya sedikit mengingatkan bahwa pada ada beberapa prinsip dari uh, bioetik, yaitu yang pertama adalah uh, autonomi. Ya di mana kita harus memberikan pada pasien kita kemampuan untuk memutuskan uh, apa yang uh, sesuai dengan pasien. Juga ada prinsip beneficent, di mana kita uh, harus memberikan kebaikan ya, uh, tidak uh, uh, dan non-maleficent, tidak atau mencegah adanya uh, keburukan atau kecelakaan. Dan yang terakhir adalah uh, justice atau keadilan di mana uh, adil by pasien juga buat masyarakat dan uh, uh, secara keseluruhan. Lalu dalam dialisis ada beberapa tantangan etik yang dalam masalah beneficent ya bahwa kita dengan dialisis ini kita bisa menurunkan mortalitas dan mobilitas dan juga meningkatkan uh, kualitas hidup dan juga meningkatkan produktivitas serta diharapkan pasien akan uh, hidup uh, lebih lama, harapan hidup lebih panjang dan bisa mendapatkan 
transplantasi. Sedangkan pada non efisien kita ada beberapa hal yang perlu diperhatikan, yaitu mengenai pembiayaan dari dialisis, adanya ketidakadilan misalnya bisa dalam sistem kesehatan, ada masalah geografis, juga strategi untuk menghemat karena biaya yang tinggi ini perlu diperhatikan, tetapi tidak menyebabkan peningkatan mortalitas dan morbiditas, dan juga perhatian untuk menurunkan kos atau biaya secara keseluruhan. Sedangkan untuk otonomi, kita harus perhatikan pasien pilihan pasien, kita harus mendiskusikan pilihan modalitas dialisis termasuk peritoneal dialisis di tahap awal kita harus sudah menyampaikan pilihan-pilihan dialisis baik hemodialisis maupun peritoneal dialisis. Sedangkan untuk keadilan beberapa hal harus diperhatikan yaitu equity kesamaan untuk seluruh pasien-pasien dengan penyakit ginjal ini harus diperhatikan juga ke keadilan untuk baik dari urban di kota dan di daerah supaya tidak terjadi ketimpangan dalam pelayanan kesehatan khususnya dialisis juga beberapa hal masalah agama etnik dan juga sosial gender ini juga harus diperhatikan mungkin ini adalah beberapa hal yang perlu kita ingat masalah-masalah etik yang bisa terjadi pada pasien-pasien dialisis dan juga pasien-pasien peritoneal dialisis. Uh, we now move the the first speakers. Uh, admin can he share this? Yeah. The first speaker is Dr. Lily Musahar. Uh, she is now uh, president of Malaysian Society of Nephrology. Uh, She is a consultant nephrologist in at Hospital Tuanku Jaafar Seremban Negeri Sembilan. Uh, we are fortunate to have really Dr. Lili Musahar to talk to us uh, about uh, why choose PD. Yeah, we all look forward to your talk, Dr. Lili. Please. Thank you, Dr. Pringo. Pringo. Um, So, good evening everyone. Selamat malam. So, I was given the task to give this talk uh, which is titled Why Choose PD. So, for the next 30 minutes or so, I will try to explain when we choose a kidney replacement therapy between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, why a patient should cho cho choose PD. So, number one of the outline that I, that I will highlight is making the right decision for a patient on dialysis modality and understanding the reason for choosing PD and the patient selection for PD. Are all patients suitable actually for this modality? So, when we talk about uh, kidney replacement therapy, usually when the patient's GFR is less than 30 mils per minute, This is considered already advanced chronic kidney disease. So when the patient has um, reached that level of advanced kidney disease, we should already implement the patient on pre-dialysis education, shared decision making, and finally to subject the patient to make a decision what type of kidney replacement therapy that they want. So I think you all know are aware that there are three key treatment strategies when the patient has Um, reach the advanced CKD. One, of course, in younger age group, less than 60, the first option should be renal transplant if there is no uh, contraindication. And the second one is, is dialysis, which is either the patient may choose PD or HD. And the third option, which is conservative care, there is a no dialysis treatment. So when we talk about kidney replacement therapy, we should implement shared decision-making, which is all what we mentioned as DM. So what does shared decision-making means? So a shared decision-making is when you pre prepare the patient, you provide the patient uh, knowledge and education on the dialysis modality that's available, and also the kidney replacement therapy is available. And it's a two-way communication where the patient have a choice 
to ask the health provider which is uh, the good option for them and at the same time also we should also um, prepare the patient in terms of vascular access or PD access when during the shared decision making and what are the possible uh, complications that mission a patient can encounter when they choose that modality. So regardless of modality use, survival rates are greater for patients who have a choice. So this is a paper in 2005, many years ago, where this paper were looking at the association of patient autonomy with increased survival among new diagnosis patients on more all modalities. And it is noted that if a patient made uh, their own choice on the kidney replacement therapy modality, they have a better survival uh, compared to those whose uh, the choice of kidney replacement therapy are being made by the physician choice. And this is um, by Tonelli et al., where this is a framework for establishing integrated care programs in low and medical income countries. So it is a pyramid and you can see that at the base of the pyramid, there's a treatment to delay or prevention strategies to, uh, from progression from kidney disease to kidney failure. Subsequently, the second level of the pyramid is the conservative care for patients who uh, wish or who cannot do um, renal uh, dialysis. And the peak of the pyramid, actually, you can see, is the three uh, option of kidney transplantation, which is the priority, and subsequently is peritoneal dialysis and finally is hemodialysis. So this is the uh, integrated care that Tonelli has tried to highlight in, in uh, countries which is in low and middle income countries. If you look at the distribution of dialysis globally, so this is from USRDS data 2020, Hong Kong has the highest uh, penetration of peritoneal dialysis because since 1984, Hong Kong have implemented PD first policy. And subsequently, Thailand in the Asia in the Southeast Asia countries have implemented PD first policy in 2008. However, last year Thailand have the government have changed this policy to patient centered care, where they provide the option of both similarly between HD and PD for the patient in the population. And as you can see here in Indonesia, about less than 10% actually are on less than uh, on PD and majority of the patient on in Indonesia are actually on hemodialysis. I think that's similar in Malaysia. In Malaysia, 85% of our population actually are on hemodialysis and 15% only are on peritoneal dialysis. So why should certain, an individual should choose PD rather than hemodialysis? As you can see at the list here, I will uh, highlight one by one. You can see that there are a, a few reasons why the patient should choose PD. The first one is the patients have better and technique survival. I think when you look at the um, long-term studies, they have conflicting results when they look at patient survival between PD and HD because the randomized control trials are underpowered, it's difficult and not ethical to randomize um, doing a randomized study when uh, between two options of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. So much of the RCTs are underpowered and there's a large heterogeneity in the study design with different patient background and also the statistical method use. And multi-center studies, however, there are more of observational studies and there are modality selection bias. So the conflicting results of patient survival in PD versus HD have um, actually um, push away patients uh, also nephrologist decision to decide whether PD actually has a better survival or HD has a better survival. But the critical review have shown that PD is associated with equivalent or better survival among non-diabetic and younger diabetic patient and PD has an equal or lower mortality rate during the first one to two years because, because this is the time where the patient still have the residual renal function. After two years, when PD patients starts losing their residual renal function, so the, equal, uh, the mortality between PD and HD actually equalize. And you can see this is what I meant where this is, uh, when you look at the all-cause mortality, PD actually after five years have a lower uh, death as compared to hemodialysis, where initially, uh, this is uh, in 2005, 
um, slowly the peritoneal dialysis has actually, if compared to earlier years of 1996, where HD is much better survival, but after 2005, you can see that the graph starts to uh, cross over where PD has a lower death compared to hemodialysis. So I think one of the reasons, this is by Jeff Pearl in Canada, where they look at the difference of uh, between the outcome of incident and stage renal disease patient, so starting HD with a catheter versus PD or a hemodialysis patient using a native AVF. And the lower survival of patient uh, from this Canadian organ replacement therapy have shown that patients who, uh, who are using uh, catheter have a lower uh, survival as compared to patients who are on hemodialysis using a fistula or a PD using a PD catheter. So what about technique survival? Because of the improvement in PD connectology over the years, there is actually improvement in the peritonitis rate. I understand, I, I, I'm aware that I think you are also, um, we have been shown that peritonitis rate actually has multifactorial factor, contributing factor. It's not only the individual patient's factor, but also the uh, PD uh, unit, how large it is, and how the training are being done. But however, with relates to the improvement in PD connectology, they are actually in uh, most of the uh, PD units, the peritonitis rate have uh, improved. And with the PD catheter placement technique, with the peritonoscopic technique, the laparoscopic technique, it actually has reduced the catheter-related technique failure also. And finally, with the more biocompatible solutions, where the patient has tend to have a lower, it has been shown to have a lower risk of peritonitis. And in later studies also, then some biocompatible PD solution studies shows they have actually reduced the peritonitis rate. So what about improve uh, about the cardiovascular stability? So PD actually has been shown it has can improve the cardiovascular uh, mortality in terms uh, compared to hemodialysis. So this is a paper by Foley et al. They look at the uh, incidence of death in patients uh, rate per 100 patients per year after long interdialytic interval. And if you look at this graph, you can see that in patients who are on hemodialysis, when they rest for two days of, hemo, uh, of interval of dialysis before they are, uh, continue with their session, the highest uh, in admission for cardiac cause or all cause um, actually were uh, higher at peak when the patient have an uh, inter interval of two days without dialysis. But if compared to PD, um, there were no difference in at all uh, uh, in the week of PD, as you can see consistently in this uh, graph, where irrespective of Sunday to Saturday, the admission or expected number of deaths actually was similar, if, if which is uh, different as compared to hemodialysis, where, where it will peak on the day after two days of interval without dialysis. So this is looking at the probability of sudden cardiac death. Uh, this is from the USRDS data. And you can look at here that after few months after initiation of dialysis, hemodialysis had a higher probability of sudden death as compared to PD. And this is by Chris uh, et al., uh, Chris McIntyre, have shown that in patients who are on hemodialysis, they will encounter repetitive myocardial ischemia. Starting after they initiated hemodialysis, after the first hour and the second hour, and it, the lowest of the mean blood flow, lowest will be at the end of four hours. Subsequently, after termination of hemodialysis, only the blood mean blood flow will start to pick up. So this uh, uh, happens, repetitive myocardial ischemia, even if the patient has absence of coronary artery disease. And uh, the patient will encounter myocardial stunning, and this will develop into heart failure in long-term hemodialysis patient. So what do you mean by myocardial stunning? So HD-induced myocardial stunning means that there will be myocardial reduced in blood flow, and this will lead to myocardial ischemia. And because of the myocardial ischemia, there will be some regional wall motion abnormalities. And finally, uh, for long term, at one point of time, the patient can develop cardiac failure. 
However, just to highlight to you, myocardial stunning doesn't occur in PD. And this is another paper which is uh, quite recently done uh, in uh, published in Jason. And actually, hemodialysis also can cause acute brain injury. So this is a paper where they look at 17 HD patients. And what they did was actually they do a, a proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy before and also during a single dialysis session, hemodialysis session. So um, you can see here when they look at the outcome, there were multiple regions of um, the white matter, intradialytic fractional anisotropy and uh, diffusion also reduced. So interestingly, this pattern is actually similar, can be seen in hyperacute stroke and is consistent with cytotoxic edema secondary to ischemia. So even a single hemodialysis session, it can lead to an acute brain injury. Um, so um, like I mentioned just now, it's not only the cardiovascular, it has impact if the patient is exposed to hemodialysis, but for a single hemodialysis session, the patient also can uh, have a risk of acute brain injury if, when the patient opted for hemodialysis. So the next one is the preservation of residual function. Uh, in PD, uh, you uh, have been shown that with each five liters of one uh, per seven three meter squared increase in the weekly residual GFR, actually it reduces the relative risk of death by twelve percent. And um, jet residual GFR is actually very very crucial in patient on uh, end stage kidney disease because once they lose their uh, residual function, their tendency to develop fluid overload and overhydration. And this is an independent, uh, independent, independent uh, contributing factor for mortality. So another thing which is uh, uh, Liao et al. have shown that the rate of residual function decline was an even stronger predictor of survival than the baseline of residual function at the start of dialysis. So, uh, just to highlight to you, again, in PD, they have better residual function. Not only that, they tend to lose it very slowly as compared to hemodialysis and the rate of decline is a strong predictor of survival. Uh, this is just to show you um, what is, why is it very important to preserve the residual function, not only for fluid removal, but as you can see here within this uh, graph, the white bar actually is the peritoneal clearance and the gray bar is the renal clearance. So in a patient who has uh, lost their residual function, actually the beta-2 microglobulin uh, actually uh, clearance are much, much lower. They tend to lose this uh, benefit uh, effect. And another way of how we can preserve the residual function is by the use of ACE inhibitor and ARPs and avoid nephrotoxicity and also use biocompatible PD solution. And in PD, it has been shown that uh, after two years on PD only, the respiratory function starts to uh, be, be lost. Next is the quality of life of a patient in PD, which I think in um, Jakarta, I think you, this is quite common in Indonesia in the city. Um, it had a lot of traffic. So if patient on hemodialysis, the time is very time consuming to go to a hemodialysis center. And, but of course, if you patient on PD, they can actually have the benefit of avoiding all this traffic and time consuming. Not only that, uh, besides uh, the time consuming, sometimes the patient also have to incur cost for the transportation for a hemodialysis patient from the house to commute to the hemodialysis center. But for PD, they are convenient. It can be done CAPD or APD at home at their own time, and they can adjust the schedule according to their lifestyle. Well, because some of the patient might be working and some of them are might be going uh, to college or university. Um, I think uh, if I'm, um, I'm sure that um, some of you do encounter where patients are still very active. They would like to go for holidays and uh, also um, for some uh, religious uh, events. 
and they might want to do the PD or HD in uh, the places that they are going for uh, the trip. So in hemodialysis, it's very difficult where certain countries is very expensive if, if the patient wants to go to for a trip overseas. However, in PD, we can make arrangement and the patient can just bring their PD solutions uh, to the place that they want and they can make arrangement with the PD center there where the transportation of the PD fluid can be arranged by the industry. So in in uh, relation to uh, the quality of life, a PD patient has a better quality of life where they are, can be allowed to spend uh, what they enjoy, especially if you, they want to go for traveling. And uh, another thing why PD is a, a better choice of dialysis modality and maybe the only choice for a patient if they are living in remote and rural area where they have, have a challenging uh, of getting to a nearest hemodialysis center, maybe there's uh, no electricity also to, in a, to develop a PD, HD unit near to their uh, housing area. So they might need to travel maybe two, three hours away to, uh, to get an access for hemodialysis unit. And uh, some of these patients are not keen for relocation. So if we want to relocate them to a city where it's more convenient, the patients or individual may not want to do that. And uh, in this term, so PD actually is the best option. As you can see in the right lower, lower uh, part of this photo, this is a patient in our rural area in Malaysia where they are taking, uh, transporting their Baxter or PD solution back to their um, living area and uh, which is they need to have a boat to cross the river. So what are the other things is uh, affecting uh, employment? Uh, most of our patients, sometimes they tend to be younger age group. They are still employed and they want to maintain the several, same level of employment before they start dialysis. And this is a paper uh, which were done and they noted that uh, from USRDS data of age less than 65, um 82.5 were on 82.5 percent were on hemodialysis 17.5 percent initiated pd and those who maintained the same level of employment from six months prior were significantly more likely to start pd than hd um, so i think to support the patient who are think to make a living who would like to continue their employment pd is a better option for them where they can uh, manage the time for their PD exchange at home, and then they will travel to their home or workplace, and subsequently after work, they can come back to their house and do the subsequent PD exchange. Next is the infection rates and hospitalization. As you all know, in a hemodialysis unit, the risk of uh, infection actually is higher uh, for cross-infection for hepatitis B and hepatitis C and maybe retroviral HIV as compared to PD. Because PD, they are doing it at home. They are not exposed to blood or any needles and the risk of contagious uh, infection are much, much lower compared to hemodialysis. And uh, this is a, a few many years ago paper, and you can see here in Malaysia, the risk of hepatitis uh, B and hepatitis C infection among hemodialysis patients across the world in uh, Asia actually is higher in hemodialysis as compared to uh, peritoneal dialysis. And with the recent COVID-19 pandemic era, I'm sure that most of you have experienced where, major, uh, not majority, I'm sorry, uh, many of the patients who uh, comes to the hosp being hospitalized with COVID-19 are actually hemodialysis patients. And we have problems of uh, trying to cordon off this COVID-19 to spread among our hemodialysis facility and even of the patient of coming to the hemodialysis when they share transportation. But with PD, they have lower risk of this contagious uh, COVID-19 during the pandemic era. And studies have shown that actually PD patients have a lower risk of COVID-19 compared to hemodialysis. And this paper actually uh, from C uh, CKJ actually I have to trying to say that we should start we should it is time to promote here home hemo and peritone dialysis um, after encountering this COVID-19 era. 
And next is the out. What is the outcome? What are the advantage of PD compared to PhD? And this is looking at transplant. Uh, when the patient wants to have an option of transplant, kidney transplant, it actually the outcome is being influenced by the previous dialysis modality. And this is a few authors who have shown that. 12% uh, of PD patient versus 16% of HD patient who received renal transplant had delay, delayed graft survival. And patients who are on hemodialysis actually were more anoric with delayed graft function as occurred to peritoneal dialysis. So in a younger age group patient who are fit, who have an option of transplant in future, in the near future, it is best to put the patient on PD rather than hemodialysis in terms they have a lower risk of delayed graft survival and they have a uh, lower risk of anoric post-renal transplant. So a young fit patient, like I've alluded earlier, should be on PD before getting a kidney. And um, how about, should we PD be offered to everyone? How sh should we select the patient which is best to be on PD? And this is just to highlight to you the psychosocial factors and the medical factors that may influence the choice of PD modality, where psychosocial factors, usually our PD nurse will assess the patient in terms of their home environment, in terms of their water supply, and also uh, the occupation that they are, uh, uh, are doing for this individual and the family support. And for the medical factors in terms of the dexterity, whether they can do perform the PD or self-care, or they need assistance, whether their patients have a good eye vision uh, for this. And in terms of, in some, some, some patients, they have um, extensive abdominal injury, surgery where it's not feasible to do PD uh, and also looking at the uh, vascular excess, where sometimes the patient have failed vascular excess, exhausted vascular excess, and PD is the only choice after um, after exhausting the vascular excess, they are undergoing multiple times of surgery. What about age? Does age matter? Whether um, older young older people are not suitable for PD? So actually, frailty versus chronological age should be assessed. It has been shown that patients who are frail actually predisposed to poor outcome. But if the elderly patient are still fit, they are still able to be independent, they, the similar outcome of a technique failure are similar uh, between our older age group and the younger age group. And even peritonitis rate between, between the elderly have shown no difference in the peritonitis episode and the spectrum of causative organism between the elderly age group and the younger age group was similar. So what about body habitus? So they, previously, um, there some centers will actually have a cutoff point of what is the patient's body weight that the patient should be on PD and what are the cutoff point of body weight that the patient should not be on PD. However, uh, body habitus have shown that um, it has uh, less, uh, um, if you look at this, it has a choice of body habitus and PD. Those who have a higher BMI actually have a better outcome compared to lower outcome. And um, this is paper by stack where, like I said, some nephrologists are very less likely to recommend PD as an option for a patient with body weight of more 91 kg. I think more are worried about how to put a PD catheter with the challenges. Um, however, with the new technique of uh, PD catheter insertion with Prof. Dr. Fadlina will allude later, I think you can see that body weight is not actually an obstacle for patient to be on PD um, uh, in terms of uh, related to PD catheter insertion. And this is to show just now that overweight have a better survival compared to normal weight. And it is a paradoxical effect that can be seen in PD patient. So all patients should be considered suitable to be on PD except if there are absolute contraindications like I've shown here. So, uh, if they have extensive abdominal adhesion with uh, quite a huge surgical, surgical scar, so that is an absolute contraindication. And if the patient has unable to perform the PD themselves and there's no suitable assistance uh, because the patient is physically 
um, have uh, or mentally incapable of performing PD is also an absolute contraindication. And the third one, if there's uncorrectable mechanical defect that prevent the patient to perform PD or increase the risk of PD infection. However, I just want to share a successful story where this is a 52-year-old patient of ours who is staying in a very rural area and the uh, patient has been on CAPD since 2015 and he performed self-care and since then, for the past, uh, since 2015, he had zero peritonitis. So this is a, a successful story of a patient who, despite living in a remote area, the patient can perform successful PD self-care and without any peritonitis at all. So uh, I would just like to show, uh, to conclude that the patient who are, uh, who uh, have developed end stage kidney disease, uh, even at EGFR of less than 15 mils per minute, you should start to discuss of shared decision making to show uh, which is the best modality and the patient uh, should be encouraged to be in PD or be, PD should be preferred in this group of patients. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for excellent talk. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, have stressed out, uh, telah menekankan pentingnya uh, diskusi kepada pasien yang mengenai pilihan terapi pengganti ginjal uh, dan juga menyampaikan beberapa keuntungan ya, untuk uh, uh, pilihan uh, terapi uh, peritoneal dialisis tadi ya uh, dari uh, kardiak, keuntungan kardiak terhadap otak terhadap uh, renal residual function dan juga transportasi uh, pekerjaan dan telah kita dengarkan tadi uh, successful study di akhir mengenai penggunaan peritoneal dialisis. Uh, terima kasih Dr. Lily. Uh, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions during uh, the webinar, please make sure to put them into the question and answer section of the Zoom area. I'm going to introduce the uh, second speaker. The second speaker uh, is Associate Professor Dr. Norfatlina Zakaria. She is a senior lecturer in internal medicine and consultant nephrologist at the Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine and Health Science, University Putra Malaysia. Uh, she has uh, several in international or uh, national society, in uh, International Society of Retinal Dialysis, uh, is one of the council uh, members. Please, Dr. Uh, uh, Nur Fatlina Zakaria. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pringo. Assalamualaikum and a very good um, evening. Selamat malam semua. Um, today, I'm going to talk about PT catheter insertion in this ISPD Indonesian webinar, the first series. And for all information, I actually gave similar topic on the pre-Congress catheter insertion in ISPD workshop last uh, year, 2022. So I hope this can give some ideas on to start PD. We need to also be good in catheter insertion because it is the most important vital actually skill of a successful PD program. So I have nothing to disclose. I'm working as per Dr. Pringo uh, this introduction just now. So for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to give you all some ideas on what do you need to know, particularly the pre-operative assessment and also the preparation for the PD catheter implantation. And at the end of the day, I will try to sum up so that you can have an idea on how to get a PD catheter inserted in a patient. So as I said, peritoneal dialysis catheter is the very most important thing in a patient to start PD. Without PD catheter, PD cannot be done. It is actually an excess in uh, which established by creating a controlled cutaneous peritoneal fistula with a catheter device that breaches the abdominal wall. 
So PD catheter, when we evaluate the patient, we can actually plan properly because we can actually insert the PD catheter and use it immediately as compared to if we want to go to make a patient go for hemodialysis, you have to wait for the fistula to measure. And early use of PD catheter with low PD fluids are allowable now, yeah, low volume intensity, which actually have less uh, in complication if we do it and early evaluation to assess the possibility of PD catheter placement with a plan for surgical catheter insertion can be made within four to six weeks prior to anticipated initiation of PD. These are uh, happen when the patient actually cannot be go by a normal um, bedside tank of insertion that you need a surgical help to insert the catheter. So ladies and gentlemen, the most important part before starting any PD to a patient is a very good informed consent and pre-dialysis education so that they understand what are the complications which is potentially can happen when we insert the catheter. So the nature, the indication, the complication which might arise from the procedure must be explained properly to the patient. And According to the peritoneal dialysis guideline, we must have a proper PD access team. So not everybody can just simply put a catheter like an IJC. We recommend that each center who wants to do PD should have a dedicated team involved in implantation and care of the peritoneal catheter. So it could be your nephrologist, it could be a surgeon. It might also involve anesthesiology for a difficult catheter insertion but the most important person is actually the PD nurse and PD catheter insertion should not be delegated to inexperienced unsupervised operators or else the success of the PD is not going to happen. And the first thing to do is actually to do a proper preoperative assessment as well. So this should include thorough examination, searching for hernias that might be repaired at the time of insertion or even before, or any scars as the previous slide shown by previous speaker. And we must also know to select the most appropriate catheter type and marking properly so that the exit site at a proper one should be performed. The most important part is actually selecting the right ingredient, which is the patient. So we must make sure that the patient that is going for PD is the right patient. So because this is to prevent the likelihood of procedure complication, so we must look at the abdominal scar, the body habitus. We must make sure that the medication intake is taken care properly. If the patient is on anticoagulant, you might want to stop it rather during the insertion rather than causing more complication during the procedure. We have to know the bowel opening history and the preparation and of course we must must make sure that the history of urinary retention is being asked properly and we must make sure that the patient pee prior to the procedure. So just to look at this picture again, um, the pictures that the previous speaker shows are pretty bad. Those, those with midline laparotomy scars usually are associated with multiple adhesions in the abdomen. However, it is not a very absolute contraindication. With a proper technique like peritoneal scope and laparoscope, we should be able to see the adhesion in the abdomen and perhaps still be able to insert the catheter. And appendicectomy scars with small umbilical hernia, for example, is also not an absolute contraindication, but you might want to do this together with your surgeon to see whether they can actually repair the hernia as well. Look at this obese patient. It is not a contraindicated from the place that we are practicing. We are looking at the patient as a whole. So if the patients are fit, we still are able to put the tank of catheter insertion provided we use the right catheter, the right technique. And when we have a patient with pendulous abdomen, we must mark the catheter for the exit site properly. 
So just to show you some more pictures of hernia, the sizes of hernia must be repaired first by the surgeon before we put a catheter inside. Because when we put the PD fluid and start initiation of peritoneal dialysis, the hernia might get bigger and cause a lot more complications later. So as I said about the medication, it has to be individualized to the patients that we want to put. Patients on antiplatelet, for example, aspirin, Plavix, Ciclopidid, has to be withheld this medication three to five days prior to the procedure. However, in certain centers, when the surgeons or the nephrologists are very well uh, good in hands and the patient really requires the catheter urgently, uh, this can be done uh, properly. And warfarin need to be withheld because warfarin has a longer acting and it has a bringing, we have to bridging the therapy with heparin infusion or low molecular weight heparin. And we need to evaluate the patient's coagulation status at that point of time. The bowel opening history and preparations are also one of the very important history that you need to ask. This is because we need to decrease the peritoneal contamination just in case if there is a bowel perforation. So what we do, we actually can give Ravin Enema, Syrup Lactulose or Bisocodil. So there, it is a controversial thing to do. Uh, when we use all these three like tulos or bisocodi, um, some people say that it can reduce um, bacterial translocation but uh, some of them actually can cause discomfort to the patient because patient has to go to toilet multiple times. And what about looking at the bladder evacuation? You have to ask the patient to go and pee first because uh, if you insert the catheter, we're afraid that the stylet might hit the bladder and causing bladder perforation. Hence, we need to make sure that patients have an empty bladder prior to the procedure and bladder catheterization for patients with dysfunctional bladder. And of course, always make sure that bladder palpation is done prior to the surgery or procedure. And how about starting them on prophylaxis antibiotic? According to ISPD Peritonitis Guideline 2022, a single preoperative dose of prophylactic antibiotic provide an anti-staphylococcus coverage is immediately can reduce a possibility of peritonitis. And to prepare... Hello? 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 Okay, and to prepare patients for operation site, the patient is also need to shower on the day of the procedure with chlorhexidine soap, wash or wash, and this actually reduce possible contamination with staph aureus infection. And what kind of technique that we will suggest? So basically, there are many techniques of catheter insertion. It is either you can go for surgical open technique mini laparotomy. You can also do a laparoscopic basic advanced technique or you can do a peritoneal scope technique or a sandilger technique. The two techniques that mentioned below is actually done by a, by a nephrologist. Some nephrologists in Malaysia do laparoscopic technique but surgical technique are mostly done by the surgeon. So in peritonitis guideline, uh, the implementation uh, of technique, it depends on the center that do the tank off. So for example, in my center, we do all four techniques. We have surgeon who do laparoscopy. We, do, we have surgeon who do um, open laparotomy, but we ourselves do peritonoscope and also Saldinger or bedside tank of insertion. So whatever the choice will depend on the expertise of your center. So these are just to show you some of the advantage of the catheter insertion. So there are many, but whatever it is, as long as the nephrologists are comfortable in whatever insertion, by all means, it will increase the PD penetration in your center. So these are some of the studies showing that uh, the difference between the technique. So advanced laparoscopic surgery versus 
basic laparoscopic surgery, catheter obstruction and migration significantly, significantly lower in advanced group. However, in different studies have shown that there is no difference between one-year catheter survival between percutaneous versus surgical place catheter. However, they were noted that infection and mechanical complication are actually much lower in the percutaneous group. Okay, this is also to show that if you choose a right technique, the, the survival are actually almost similar in whatever technique. So this meta-analysis has shown it. So there's another um, meta-analysis which actually look at the different um, mechanism or different um, things, um, different between the peritoneal scope be, uh, versus laparoscopy versus the open. So whichever, as I said earlier, it depends on your center and depends on the patient selection as well. So what are the type of catheter? The ideal type of PD catheter should have an excellent short inflow time. And it also has to have an excellent drainage of the abdomen with no omental wrap. So we have so many types of catheter. We have straight one, we have two cuff, one cuff, swan neck as per the picture. But the catheter that you finally select for the patient should be something that you are comfortable using and placing regardless. Yeah. So just to show you the systemic review on the significance of verse straight versus call catheter, in this study, it does say that there is no significant difference between exit site infection, peritonitis, or even migration and leakage. And survival catheter of two years differs significantly, significantly favoring straight catheter versus call catheter. But the only thing about call catheter, it actually eliminate the infusion pain due to a jet, jet, jet effect and it pain related to straight catheter tip pressure on the peritoneum, which experienced by some patients. So just to show you another RCTs on meta-analysis on the versus straight versus call catheter, it again shows not much different between two. And what about choosing whether it is a midline versus paramedian insertion? Implanting a catheter in the paramedian position through the body of the rectus muscle actually reduces the risk of pericatheter hernia and leg. But again, it goes back to the surgeon preference. So when we look at this study, uh, it does also say there is no significant difference in the case of peritonitis in exit site infection, whether you choose the midline versus paramedian insertion. And whether you want to choose the right or the left of the patient, the right side should be preferred as the tip of catheter migrated to the left upper quadrant could still be back to pelvic region with the peristaltic action of descending colon. But, however, you have, you have as per look at these cartoons, if you put the patients on the right side, the catheter can be uh, going down again, I mean, on the left side, the catheter can go down again with peristalsis. But if it's on the right side, there's a possibility that difficult for the catheter to go down again as the peristalsis go like this up to the right and then go down. So when, how do you ascertain the length of PD catheter? You have to measure properly. So the PD catheter insertion must of a suitable length. So you must to measure the catheter even before the op is being done, the surgical is being done. And we need to align the upper border of the cord to the upper border of the symphysis pubis. And we have three types of catheter, 47 cm, 57 cm and 62 cm. But for Asian, most of the time, we use 47 and 57 cm. And regardless of what Ever technique insertion, you have to make sure you avoid intraoperative complication, particularly your bladder injury, bowel injury, bleeding. And we need to also make sure that you put the catheter properly so you don't have catheter malposition, catheter kink or catheter leak. 
And just to show you some paper on intra-abdominal injury, the most important injury usually happen is the injury to inferior epigastric artery, but the reported rate are actually very low. And just to show you where your uh, inferior epigastric artery sits, so you need to try to avoid this area. And how do we avoid? We must make sure that we do uh, midline 2 cm inferior to the umbilicus and a bit to the lateral of the patients. Right, you can also use ultrasound to look for inferior epigastric artery since pokers are very common now. So these are just to add help for you to make sure that you do not hit the, inferior, the uh, vessels during the procedures. And how about perforation of bowel? So you must make sure the selection of patient is good because the perforation of bowel happen when the patient have a lot of adhesion. So these are the things that you must make sure if the patient have fungal infection, for example, because there's a question inside the thing, you must look into the abdomen to prevent adhesion. The patient can go to PD again, but we must make sure the adhesion is lesser so that the PD can function. So there are some tips to actually mitigate the catheter migration. So the best practice is we do an intra-abdominal fixation of the catheter via advanced laparoscopy, but we can do a rectal sheath tunneling, suture sling, or extra peritoneal tunneling. So these are how we can actually mitigate the catheter so that it does not run or migrate. So we do some sort of um, measurement to make sure they have some angle so that the catheter can sit nicely in the abdomen. And these are another way of looking at it where we tunnel the rectal sheath to the uh, sheath. And uh, these are also another pictures on how you can actually mitigate the catheter migration. So how about exit sign? As you seen in my previous picture, we do some, we have um, to make sure that the exit side face downwards or lateral. So these are to prevent exit side infection. So we actually have to properly put your tank of catheter uh, so that the patient can, uh, uh, can assess it and also can do the dressing, but at the same time does not be involved, uh, with, can increase the risk of peritonitis. So please do not ever suture your tank of catheter because this will cause a uh, problem, it abscesses and many more problems technically can also need the catheter. And we can flush the catheter after insertion. Uh, this will also prevent the patient to have some sort of jet uh, pain when we start using the catheter and the catheter can not be wrapped by the omentum. So the most important part after the catheter insertion is of course the post-operative care. We must make sure that the wound care is uh, healed very well and the exit wound is dressed properly. We must immobilize the catheter to prevent trauma to the exit site and calf and minimize exposure to bacteria and preventing colonization. So if possible, implantation should be timed to allow two weeks for healing prior to initiation of dialysis. Hence, you need to plan properly. But again, if you want to do acute urgent start PD, it's not a problem too. And post-operative assessment and dressing changes should be performed weekly by experienced staff or PD nurse and using an aseptic technique with a mask and glove until it heals. And the bleeding must be uh, entertain quickly by a proper team and the PD team who insert the catheter must alert surgeon if you had this kind of uh, complications and you can't wait because the complication can be a disaster. And if we insert a catheter, we must audit our catheter insertion. These are some of the audit or standards to audit your catheter which might be differ from center to 
center. So whatever it is, it depends on the center. And as long as your catheter can be used for the patient to start PD and to improve their quality of life. I think, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be my last slide. What is the prompt and effective implantation of PD catheter as well as PD management of its complication arising from the catheter insertion remains the crucial part for the success of the program. And we require a multidisciplinary approach with great enthusiasm from the PD team, along with the best practice guideline, will improve catheter outcome and long-term result, and at the end of the day, improve our PD penetration. With that, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fatina, for a comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Fatina have described the uh, preparation, patient preparation for the insertion of PD catheter and several techniques of insertion of PD catheter and tips of uh, several tips of care to prevent complication of uh, uh, PD catheter insertion. We move to the third speaker. Uh, we all already know the uh, Dr. Rudy. Uh, he is a professor of internal medicine and. University of uh, Pajajaran yeah. and uh, senior consultant of nephrologist and uh, several role in the national and international society have been uh, played by Dr. Uh, Professor Rudy. This uh, the time is your Professor Rudy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good evening for the doctors and nurses in Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, Dr. Aida, Dr. Zuhair, Dr. Lili, and Dr. Fadlina. And also, uh, good morning for the doctors in uh, States, yeah, Dr. Scott and uh, Mr. Nigel Gallardo. Okay, uh, I would like to present uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, let me share my uh, PowerPoints. Okay. Is my slides have been visible, uh, Dr. Pringle? Yeah, it's good. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the ISPD and uh, in uh, SN. Uh, has to get uh, me to present the uh, one that uh, we have the modification for from the cell general technique, the uh, tank of catheter insertion with Bandung method. It will be a simple modification for easier and safer insertion for uh, Indonesian CEP patients. Okay, the background for this uh, modification. Uh, after the nice talk from Dr. Fadlina and Dr. Lily, I, I, I have uh, shortcut this uh, slide so it won't be uh, uh, around 30 minutes. It will be less than 30 minutes. Uh, the background of this uh, presentation, uh, this modification is that uh, there, there, was, uh, there were a huge amount and sub increases of uh, CKD patients from around 2007 to, to, to until 2010. Uh, so there, 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 there were a long list waiting to get a uh, hemodiasis surfaces, but uh, the HD unit is still limited uh, back then. And the insertion of catheter before the 2008, mostly done in operating theater by the surgeon. The long waiting list to get uh, operating theater in hospital uh, is, uh, yeah, uh, it's a very, very uh, long time to uh, pass in to, to patient to get the uh, ins uh, catheter insertion for the CAPD. And there are also a uh, small fee for doctors and medical team. So the interest to the uh, CAPD is not so good back then. Uh, and also for the patient, uh, the financial will be the obstacles because there is no uh, health insurance coverage by the government or the private sectors for CKD-5D patients. So the, we, the Indonesian nephrologists, have to overcome this major 
obstacle uh, situation uh, based on the background since 2008 uh, group of young nephrologists and uh, the trainee led, uh, led by late uh, professor ruli and me and dr johnny was trying to solve this situation by modifying the insertion of the catheter uh, we done the insertion uh, not in the operating room but uh, in only the good clean room or the bedside in uh, for the patient and uh, back then in 2008 uh, the insert the insertion still used the stainless steel throw cup it's very stiff and hot with sub uh, each uh, in one side so it uh, uh, it takes a very high risk for the, uh, the patient to uh, make any per uh, perforation in the bowel uh, we use the local anesthesia there is we don't have any usg or ultrasonography back then and uh, we just trying to reduce the cost and the time for the patient who need the uh, dialysis this is our team that uh, professor ruli and me and dr joni and then after that uh, some of uh, young nephrologists as uh, that only uh, has a good intention to help the people who needs the dialysis uh, but uh, the hemodialysis is very uh, uh, small it's very uh, 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 very little uh, in the mound yeah, so the long uh, list of patients uh, they came to us and they uh, had the uh, peritoneal dialysis yeah. uh, the bandung uh, methods they use until around 2015 yeah uh, the bandung method uh, one is modificated from the cellular technique but almost the same uh, the difference is, uh, is uh, slightly different from the uh, cellular technique itself. Yeah, the spindle uh, needle was used to puncture the peritoneum and then insert the wire inside the spinal needle, and then we use the pull up route, yeah, with the blunt uh, needle or the dilator, yeah, to insert the catheter, uh, and we still use the local anesthesia, but uh, we we yeah uh, this is the slides from dr fadlina we we uh face the the same uh curiosity than the same fear that uh there is uh, a blind puncture that could be uh, uh perforate the bowel it's the main uh, consideration for us and and we have to lower the risk uh, for the internal organ puncture and lower the risk for the bleeding for the patient so uh, in around 2015-2016 we make uh, a new yeah, modification yeah uh, we name it for the Bandung method 2 yeah uh, and the uh, main uh, or the key apparatus for uh, the Bandung method 2 is the ferrous needle and also the pull apart in the reducer set yeah this is the ferrous needle. It's usually used uh, by the surgeon uh, in the uh, late uh, for the laparoscopic technique. Yeah, it uh, has a spring inside. Yeah, uh, it, this is the uh, this is the uh, the blunt uh, edges, and this one is the uh, sub edges. Yeah, with uh, uh, with from the stainless steel. Yeah we use that uh, uh that uh, how uh, why we use the ferrous needle because it has a spring inside on the top of the sub heads uh, so it can be spring back the sub heads of needle inside to the blunt uh, tube after they punctured the peritoneum so after they punctured the peritoneum they will uh, spring back inside the blunt tube so it will cover inside so the risk to puncture or to perforate the bowel is decreasing yeah so the concept of the bandung method uh, two is the sub incision only on the skin 
After skin, we make the blunt dissection from uh, subcutis to the uh, peritoneum by dissecting tools. There is no sharp cutting uh, after the skin, so it will decrease the risk uh, for the facial trauma. When we have uh, reached the peritoneum, yeah, well, we have to prepare the Paris needle with the guide wire inside. So with film puncture with Paris needle through the peritoneum, we will uh, lower the risk uh, for the internal organ uh, puncture. Yeah? And also, because there is no subcutting in the peritoneum, there is no need to stitch the peritoneum. So we have the pastor first use between five to seven days after the insertion. Yeah? And this technique would be used as uh, acute uh, PD or, or acute peritoneal uh, dialysis. This is some of the pictures uh, how we do uh, the uh, ferrous needle insertion. Yeah, this is uh, the incision yeah, for the skin. Yeah, uh, after the skin, we make yeah around three to four centimeters or. Uh, 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 or the five centimeters wide, yeah, and then we use the uh, blunt decision, the dissection, yeah, and then we to uh, we use the uh, tools to uh, separate the, the skin and the subcutaneous until we can uh, see the. Uh, fascia, the muscle, and and the peritoneum inside. Yeah. After treating the bleeding, uh, we have and then we have uh, see the peritoneum or not uh, really the peritoneum, maybe the fascia uh, after the uh, muscle. Uh, we can prepare the ferrous with the guide wire. Yeah. After we prepare the ferrous, we can make a small uh, puncture with uh, the Paris needle, yeah? Uh, we hold uh, the Paris needle with uh, 90 degrees uh, position and and we can feel the uh, puncture, the peritoneum after uh, it sounds like that, yeah? after the puncture of the peritoneum, the sub edge of the Paris needle will be spring back inside the blunt uh, coverage or the blunt needle. So uh, after we ins uh, insert the first needle, we can uh, move the guide wire inside yeah, uh, through the caudal to the back of the uh, breather. Yeah? So we can uh, put that uh, guide wire uh, in the position that we uh, have to uh, get there. Yeah? After the, the guide wire in the position, the ferrous needle can be uh, pulled out. And after the ferrous needle uh, pulled out, uh, this is the ferrous needle in the position. We uh, we think tingling the ferrous needle to the uh, caudal position uh, or the uh, into the posterior of the bladder, and we can pull out the ferrous needle with the guide wire still in the position. After that, insert the pull apart uh, dilator through the guide wire to the uh, position. Yeah? After the uh, insertion, uh, the pull apart, yeah, we can pull out the guide wire yeah, and then we uh, can test uh, the position of the pull apart uh, inside the uh, peritoneal cavity with the uh, normal saline. Yeah, if the flow is uh, good, yeah, uh, so uh, we can uh, make sure that the uh, the path uh, to inside to the uh, posterior of the bladder is uh, quite uh, uh, smooth. It's not uh, surrounded by the uh, omental or surrounded by the addition of the internal organ. Yeah. So after the uh, test for inflow and the outflow, uh, we can prepare the uh, tank of catheter with the uh, stiff uh, stainless steel, or we call it in Indonesia is mandrain. Yeah, and uh, after the pull apart has been uh, prepared, we can. 
push them inside the pull apart. Yeah. Also, don't forget that pull apart has the blue uh, dilator uh, inside. Yeah. We have to pull out the uh, blue dilator first, and then uh, we can insert uh, the uh, catheter with the mandrain inside through the uh, pull apart. Yeah. The the black one is the pull apart. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the the pull apart make uh, a path yeah inside the peritoneal cavity into the posterior of the uh, bladder yeah and we can push it uh, nice and slowly after the uh, calf yeah but the, the, the distal calf uh, reach uh, the uh, skin uh, we can uh, pull out the membrane inside yeah. So we we have left uh, the uh, the catheter, the tank of catheter inside, and then we pull apart and tear apart the pull apart section, so we can uh, uh, move uh, further the tank of catheter inside. Yeah. After the tank of catheter inside, and then the pull apart has been. Uh, uh pull out yeah we we then have to test uh, with the normal saline yeah in and the outflow yeah uh formally we use the uh, around 300 to 500 uh, uh normal saline and we uh, have to uh, view that the flow of the normal saline in flow and the outflow is a uh, smooth and nice uh, drip yeah not uh, uh, slow but have to has a good uh, not turbulence uh, flow outside the uh, peritoneal cavity yeah okay after that uh, uh, we make the tunneling yeah like the usual with uh, local anesthesia uh, the this patient is still wait we don't use any uh anesthesia that uh, make the patient uh, to go sleep but we only use the local anesthesia yeah okay this is after the tunneling we uh, make uh, the uh the stitching yeah and then we have to close uh, all the uh incision uh inside the uh, uh cutis yeah or inside the skin and then after that we have to test again uh, the in and the outflow uh, of the normal saline inside and outside the peritoneal uh, cavity yeah? okay the insertion has been uh, done and the uh, patient has been uh, prepared for uh, the end of the uh, surgery Okay, this is, uh, oh, I, I will uh, show you uh, uh, small data, but this uh, data uh, has uh, been gathered by our team. It not been established, uh, established by uh, the uh, statistic uh, person. So this is a very, very raw data that we gathered the data from 2019 until 2022. We done uh, the insertion catheter and we compared uh, between uh, the insertion by the nephrologist and the surgeon. Yeah? Uh, we uh, we done the insertion by nephrologist is around twenty three percent and the uh, by the surgeon is around twenty nine uh, patient. The uh, mean of age is not very quite different; it's around forty years old. Uh, male and female, uh, the male is uh, the majority and uh, hypertensive nephropathy is the primary uh, disease by uh, 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 from the patient. Yeah? So we, we, uh, we uh, look for the uh, operating time yeah? by the nephrologist and the surgeon is not uh, very different. Yeah? And uh, uh, the uh, post-operatic analgetic, uh, analgetic needs uh, by nephrologist is uh, quite a little bit uh, uh, lower than the surgeon and the bowel uh, perforation, hemorrhage for initial drainage, uh, peritonitis is uh, the same, yeah, 
uh, and uh, there is uh, uh, no uh, quite difference between the exit site infection, catheter migration, yeah, uh, the leakage or, uh, or outflow uh, obstruction. But uh, by the surgeon, uh, the outflow obstruction is uh, around three. Yeah, by the nephrologist, there is no outflow or obstruction. Uh, right after the uh, insertion. So this is the, uh, uh, we done it in the Fijian abdomen. So there is no uh, uh, surgery in the abdomen before. Yeah, uh, We have the functioning catheter in uh, less than three months is around 95% and by the surgeons is around 78%. Uh, so, so this is the summary of my uh, speech uh, uh, today. Uh, CIPD is a technique of dialysis that can be cheaper, safer, uh, easier than uh, HD for Indonesian patient. Catheter insertion for CIPD in Indonesia is a basic skill for all the nephrologists and uh, uh, Bandung, Bandungers nephrologists create a modification to overcome the obstacles with Bandung method two that relatively safer, easier, and quicker to do than the previous method, then Bandung method by nephrologist not inferior to the surgeon uh, technique. And we also wish um, uh, that the pra uh, practice can make it perfect and we, have, oh, we can also have the high sense of crisis. Thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, good evening and good morning for everybody. Thank you, Dr. Rudy, for interesting uh, lecture. Uh, we move to the question and answer session. Uh, there are many questions at the question and answer area, and some questions have been answered by speaker and uh, committee. Uh, now we will discuss uh, some of the question. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize to the, uh, all participants due to time constraint. Maybe we can answer all the questions that we try to uh, answer uh, most of the question. Yeah, there are several uh, uh, topic that uh, arise at the question and answer area. I think uh, first about the uh, fungal infection. Yeah, I think there are several questions about fungal infection and about the reinsertion and then uh, the management. Uh, I think Dr. Lily can uh, answer and give explanation about uh, this topic. Please, Dr. Lili. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Pringle. So for fungal infection, um, usually in precious uh, PD catheter where the patient has been converted for hemodialysis and they have no access, usually we try to salvage the PD catheter. We don't remove immediately. We will start the um, antifungal. However, if the patient has an option where it can be converted to hemodialysis, usually we will remove the PD catheter and rest the abdomen for at least four to six weeks. And after four to six weeks, only the PD catheter can be inserted. Uh, of course, you have to make sure that you treat the fungal infection properly before considering to put the PD catheter in, the new PD catheter in. Thank you, Dr. Uh, and then uh, several questions right, uh, regarding the uh, obesity. There, is there any uh, technique or any tips for this uh, type of patient in about the catheter or the management of this patient? I don't know, maybe Dr. Fadlina can add to the, this question. Thank you, Pringo. So that's a very good question. Yeah? Um, some people are obese, but the abdomen are not so much. It's just pendulous. So that's why you really have to assess the patient properly. And in our center, we, we actually put a lot of catheter bed sites for those who are obese because they just have pendulous abdomen. When we measure the catheter properly, we assess, we do plan the surgery properly, usually there'll be no problem. And then some 
question whether we should put coil or straight catheter in obese patient again it does not really matter there is no significant difference between two it's the matter of you comfortable in inserting it or not so but in certain patient who have huge uh, intra abdominal fat yeah um we can actually scan it also if you have the thing you can ask the surgeon to help you because you need to really look into the fascia and the to insert the catheter so from my point of view we do insert but you have to select the patients properly thank you uh, dr fatina i think uh, the next uh, question for dr rudy uh, regarding the uh, uh, difficulty on contraindication of the uh, explained technique of uh, PD catheter insertion. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Pringo, and thank you for the questions. Uh, so, uh, firstly, uh, the assessment for the uh, patient to uh, to measure about the difficulty uh, uh, to operate the patient is has, uh, has to be the uh, primary object to do for, uh, by the team of the CFPD. Yeah, so the uh, the difficulty rate has to be uh, uh, punctually uh, designed in the first. Yeah, and our technique has uh, also uh, 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 sorry, keterbatasan limitation. Yeah, our technique has also limitation. Uh, and that it, it, uh, yeah, our technique is also has not been uh, proof uh, for the difficult patient like uh, the patient with uh, very very obese, very old, or after very bad uh, uh, abdominal surgery before. Yeah, the uh, previous abdominal surgery like the appendicitis surgery or uh, sexual cesarea. Yeah, it uh, still can be done by our technique, yeah. But uh, if the uh, previous abdominal surgery is very, very bad, uh, but the peritoneal uh, cavity is uh, still can be functioning, uh, we will refer the patient to the surgery because the patient has, uh, yeah, our prediction that the patient has to be. Uh, generally anest uh, anest uh, uh, anesthesia yeah and uh, the opening has to be very wide yeah our technique can cannot do uh, some kind of uh, patient maybe uh, that's our, our uh, my answer thank you dr pringo thank you dr rudy uh, next several question discuss about the transition from uh, sd to pd and uh, Maybe Dr. Lily can answer those questions. Okay, so um, I think we all have to be aware that uh, in kidney replacement path therapy, the dialysis is an integrated care. Not all patients can be on PD forever. They may convert to HD, where do we need to transition them from PD to HD? And not all HD can be forever on HD. Sometimes they need to be converted to PD, especially when they have exhausted vascular access. So usually when they have exhausted vascular access, sometimes we need to do urgent start PD. We do not have time to transition them to uh, uh, do a PD, to insert a PD catheter and wait for two weeks until we start the training. So some patients we are required to do urgent start PD where the PD training or the PD uh, initiation are being done less than two weeks. So the way that we do urgent start PD is actually where you uh, even can start the PD um, exchanges even after 48 hours or immediately the next day after the PD catheter insertion. How but you need to do it slowly with a lower dwell volume, maybe 500 mils per minute and it's best to be on supine where we can put them the PG, PD, uh, patient on cycler, uh, APD. But if you do not have uh, a PD cycler, you can do uh, perform CAPD. But please advise the patient to reduce the mobilization because there's a risk of leaks, especially in obese patient where the wound is not healed yet. Subsequently, you slowly increase the dwell volume from 500 
800 over the subsequent days and maybe after one week or two weeks only you can fulfill the maximum two liter dual volume so that's how you transit if for urgent start pd but if you have time where the patient still have a catheter which is functioning but you want to do the transition slowly then you can do it properly and spend time of uh, initiating initiating the pd uh, exchanges after two weeks where the wound is already healed and this will reduce the uh, risk of leaks Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, regarding the uh, time, or is there a limit uh, of time in uh, SD patient in SD to can be transferred to PD, Dr. Lee? Um, actually, there's no limit of time because I do see there was a question how many years of patient on HD where it can impact the outcome. So actually, there's no... Uh, there's no evidence to show that if the patient is on three years, five years, or 10 years on HD, that when you convert to the patient on PD, that, that there was a different outcome. No. So there's no, uh, there's no evidence to show that. If the patient uh, prefer to convert to HD because maybe the patient has a BKA had a, uh, and not able to commute to a nearby HD center anymore, and they want to convert to PD, I do have patients uh, like that, and uh, maybe sometimes they need an assistant to do it because they are uh, uh, unable to perform self-care. So there's no time limit in HD. You can switch from PD to HD or HD to PD. Any of point of time, it's just that you need to organize in a way and try to avoid uh, making it um, urgently without being planned properly. Because if it's not being planned properly, you may... Uh, uh, um, encounter certain complication. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lini. Uh, there are several questions uh, that uh, asked about the creation of the exit site, uh, whether it can be higher from the insert site or whether uh, uh, and which one is lower risk of uh, infection. Can Dr. Fatlina explain this? Thank you, Pringle, again. Thank you for the questions. Um, okay, so exit site infection uh, has to be made as such that the patients are able to do dressing at the exit site. So it, it, it is also to make sure that it is not near the area that can cause um, infection to go. For example, your belt line under the pendulous abdomen and things like that. However, in certain uh, situation, you can actually insert an exit site a bit higher. For example, in cases where you have a demented lady or a schizophrenic guy who always try to pull out the catheter. So we do have some sort of ways to actually tunnel the catheter away from the patients from being able to actually pull out the catheter. Uh, but you need skills to do this. And whether it is higher or lower from the, uh, from the insertion site does not matter as long as the patient is able to do the dressing properly and then it is face down and and not uh, increase the risk of infection. So that, that's the usually way to go if you want to decide on exit site infection, like exit site placement. I think to add to this question, I, uh, there are uh, several questions about the uh, antibiotic of choice or uh, prophylaxis before tank of catheter insertion. Yeah, as I said earlier in the slides, it's an anti-staphylococcus, but you also have, uh, you can actually choose kefazolin, but in Malaysia, because there's some question asking what Malaysia use, we usually use cefroxime or zinasaf, yeah, uh, but we can also use kefazolin. Um, it depends on the biogram of the center, uh, but we do not advise use of vancomycin because there's a question also about vancomycin because that's too high already and we don't want to prevent MRSA or VRSA in uh, this setting. So anti-staphylococcus will do it. Thank you, Dr. Falina. Uh, I think uh, there is a question uh, from Indonesia. Uh, we don't have a many choice of catheter size uh, especially in pediatric, 
patient. Dr. Rudy, do you have any experience or any uh, comment? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, we now have a lot of uh, pediatric patients in our uh, HD unit in Hasan Sadikin Bandung, uh, Hasan Sadikin Hospital Bandung. Uh, the, the age is around maybe 12 to 18 years old, yeah. And the patient uh, uh, do the HD because we don't have the uh, the right size catheter for them uh, because the the pediatric patient is very small and the catheter uh, that uh, covered by the universal coverage health coverage is only the standard around twenty centimeters and and, and only have the straight uh, catheter not quite catheter yeah. So uh, in this in this case, the patient go to the HD. It's it's uh, yeah, it's a very uh, sad situation for uh, for the uh, pediatric patients. Yeah. So uh, well, but we still uh, encourage our uh, Ministry of Health uh, MOH yeah to uh, prepare for the pediatric patient and to uh, train uh, the the surgeon or the pediatrician uh, pediatrician uh, nephrologist uh, to insert the catheter. We have a good uh, uh, relationship with the pediatrician, yeah. Uh, to just to okay, just to increase. Sometimes, uh, oh, and also we have uh, one experience that a very big patient from the Middle East and and uh, he just uh, uh, put the catheter for the CAPD, but the exit site is in the thoracal, not the uh, not in the abdomen. Uh, so the uh, catheter is uh, very very long. It's almost maybe fifty centimeters, yeah, or half a meters uh, from the uh, uh, from the point uh, under under the uh, umbilical. And the exit site is uh, on the thoracal, and the patient is uh, quite comfortable with that because uh, on the previous uh, surgery, uh, the previous insertion, the catheter is uh, on normal size, and the patient cannot see because the pendulum uh, abdomen. Yeah, the patient cannot see where is his uh, transfer site, where is his catheter because sometimes the transfer set has been uh, engulfed by his uh, own abdomen. Yeah? And uh, I see that the surgeon make a very good innovation that uh, the catheter uh, uh, exercise is uh, on the thoracal. It's very, very nice uh, approach for the patient and he's uh, uh, still in, in good uh, condition back then. Okay? Uh, that's our uh, experience. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pingo. Dr. Fatina, do you have anything to add to this question? Um, actually, the measurement of the patients to the catheter are the most vital mm -hmm. things. Um, so um, in one of the Tankoff workshop, they actually modify the use of um, catheter, the normal IJC catheter, smaller size to become a PD catheter. So um, in certain places like South Africa, you have no option. You have to modify to whatever needs that the patient, as long as we can save, save the patient. But it's a good uh, uh, initiation for you all to actually get a proper size so that the new nephrologists learn on how to do it properly. Thank you. Uh, some of the questions also asking uh, about the peritoneal dialysis surface in rural area. Uh, Dr. Lee, can you uh, explain about the uh, this surface in the rural area, especially about the uh, water supply? Yes. Um, in Malaysia, we have a um, challenging geographical area, especially in Borneo, the East Malaysia, where um, there is problems with water supply and also electrical supply. So what our uh, nephrologists and PD nurses um, make some modification, uh, at this area, they will cook, boil the uh, water from the river or from the well, and they put it in a container with a 
but there's a tap coming up from that container. So when the patients need to do hand washing, they just use that water. And the PD nurse will advise the patient to replace that water every two days. And this is the way how, I, because I, I, I have a photo, but I do not, I could, I was not able to share where this patient will use that water um, for the hand hygiene and uh, to wash their hand. There are patients who can afford, they use the mineral water to wash their hand. Uh, but of course, it's expensive. They have to buy from uh, uh, using, uh, maybe it costs more uh, expenses to them. And uh, that is one way of how we advise the patient. I have many years ago, a patient who was using a water from a waterfall. So that is, they put, they modify it, put that water direct into the house because it is fresh water, it is clean, and the patient uses that uh, directly uh, being pumped into the house. So uh, that is how um, our experience in rural area um, to do it. Um, but the best thing, the other thing is if they really don't have water supply, you can just use the hand rub where you put a puddle in your hand, uh, rub at least for uh, 15 seconds until it dried up and then can, the patient can do the uh, uh, PD exchanges. Thank you. Dr. Rudy, can you add for the experience in uh, West uh, Java? Uh, do you have any yeah, Dr. many Dr. rural area in there? Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Rile and Dr. Fabina, I would like to welcome you in uh, uh, National Congress of Penetry in October. Um, also, maybe Dr. Scott, uh, Dr. Miguel, or Dr. Isaac, uh, please welcome to Bandung City. Yeah. Uh, in West, West Java, our demography uh, is uh, 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 very uh, surrounded by uh, high and, uh, and active volcano and in the south and the, uh, also in the north of uh, West Java there is uh, 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 Indian Ocean and the Java uh, Sea yeah so a uh, very uh, uh, distinctive uh, area we, we have to cover in uh, West Java uh, uh, area and the distribution is the key point of the CAPD because uh, there is a lot uh, of the uh, bag, yeah, uh, dialysis bag, uh, four times a day, uh, tw times two or eight uh, kilo, yeah, eight kilo uh, times three is around two hundred and forty kilo uh, plus uh, uh, everything is around two hundred and fifty uh, kilo a month that uh, the patient has to bring uh, or the dialysis uh, back to uh, their, their house. Yeah? So it's uh, uh, quite complex for the distribution, distribution company. Yeah? Sometimes uh, if uh, the, the road is uh, uh, full of water or flood, yeah? they, can, uh, they cannot uh, deliver the bag to the houses. So they may be uh, put in the uh, Piscasmas or our uh, community health uh, center yeah, or the Puskesmas and the near Puskesmas. And then after that, they can bring by a uh, small cart, yeah? uh, not car, but cart, yeah? kereta, kereta dari kayu yeah, from uh, wood and uh, a big tire and also or maybe with uh, a small uh, wooden boat, yeah. Uh, if uh, the house near the uh, uh, river, yeah. So, so its uh, distribution is uh, very uh, high, uh, uh, high cost uh, for the CAPD patient. Maybe the distribution can be higher uh, the cost than the uh, uh, the dialysis uh, itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe that's our experience. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rudy. Uh, to Dr. Fatlina, I think there is a question about the uh, collaboration with a surgeon. Uh, what is your experience and uh, is, is it essential to uh, for the uh, PD service in the hospital? Thank you. 
it is very very essential they have to be our best friend bff we yeah? are best friend forever because if we had any complication during a nephrologist insertion they are the one who's going to save our patient um uh, but if we have a good friend there's no problem at time or we want to ask them to salvage our catheter if it's migrated or to help us insert a difficult catheter that we anticipate uh, with a lot of adhesion, obesities, and many more. So, of course, having a very good friend with surgeon is a must in a PD team. Yeah, of course. Uh, there's a question. In the case of midline laparotomy scar, would you get help from surgeon for tank of intestine or peritoneoscope by nephrologist first? Okay, so if the surgeon, if the nephrologists are very confident and has done multiple peritoneal scope, they can actually have a look into the peritoneum and see whether there's a lot of adhesion or not. So most of lower segment caesarean scars are very notorious for uh, adhesion compared to any other scars. So uh, usually if we have this kind of patient, we do peritoneal scope, we have a look inside and we will look at, we think that there are so many adhesion that we need our surgeons to help out. But if your surgeons are very nice, they said no problem, give it to them. By all means, it will cut short the OT time, just let the surgeon do the difficult tank of insertion. Thank you, Dr. Fatina. Uh, Dr. Rudy, do you have any experience with a uh, surgeon in your hospital? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, there, there's a, a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, before we establish a CAPD team, we have to, I agree with uh, Dr. Fatina, we have to make a good friendship with the surgeon. If anything happen, uh, yeah, we have to call them to help us. With it, yeah. uh, so, uh, surgeon is one uh, one most uh, important uh, person in our team. Yeah, uh, that our experience in around two thousand eight. Yeah, our late uh, professor Professor uh, Ruli uh, make a good uh, relationship with the surgeon because our one our staff is uh, Doctor Rubin has a uh, 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 brother-in-law in, -law in uh, surgery department. So we we have a good, very good relationship uh, and very good uh, brothership with the uh, surgeon. Uh, yeah, we have, we, before I establish the team, we have to make a good uh, relationship with surgeon and also the anesthesiologist. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, one of our uh, good experience. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. I think there's a question for Dr. Rudy uh, regarding, is there a role of ultrasound in uh, PD catheter insertion, Dr. Rudy? Yes. And in yes, thank you, Dr. Pringo, and thank you for the question. Uh, in the insertion, we use the ultrasound guidance in the three step. Uh, uh, first one is the preoperative, the second one is intraoperative, and the third one is the postoperative. In the preoperative, uh, we have to look, uh, yeah, we have to look around uh, with the ultrasonogram in the uh, bowel, uh, in the abdomen and the bowel cavity. If there is any mass, any maybe any. Uh, big uh, stone in there and maybe uh, the yeah the movement of the bowel is not very good yeah high uh, uh, high in, uh, sorry uh, the uh, the uh, the bladder is uh, very very thick yeah because of the inflammation or the uh, or the infection uh, previously and also we have to look for the liver uh, is there any uh, enlargement of liver? Is there any uh, in infection around liver? Any any uh, uh, stone in the uh, bile and and so on? It just have to. We have to make sure. Be, uh, beside the 
USG, we use also the uh, plain uh, film for the uh, abdomen just to make sure there is no uh, too not too much uh, air in the air and fecal in the abdominal area. In inside the operative, we use the ultra uh, sonography uh, to make sure that the position you know, of the tip of the catheter is around the bladder. We use the small uh, 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 normal saline around 50 uh, mils yeah, and push inside the uh, catheter of uh, intraoperative and we have to see you know, we can see by the also sonogram there is a small bubble yeah uh, behind the bladder so if the, we can see the small bubble behind the bladder so the tip of the catheter is in place yeah and after the uh, surgery we we have to make sure again yeah the position of the catheter if there is any uh, complication inside the abdomen and uh, so on yeah i think uh, it's uh, uh, it's the, uh, we have to use the usg we have to prepare the usg if we don't have the usb usg uh, 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 there is no uh, contraindication if you can do the uh, catheter insertion in your uh, 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 hospital just uh, do it. Uh, USG is just a tool uh, that uh, uh, can uh, help us in certain way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pringle. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. Dr. Fatline, do you have anything to add to this question? Yeah, um, as I said, not every center have uh, ultrasonography to actually use for insertion of tankor. Mostly, it is used to look into the vessels, um, not sh um, make sure that you do not hit the inferior gastric artery or any other vessels, and to look at the bladder. Because using ultrasound requires a skills for you to actually make sure that you can see the bubbles and things like that. Some center do look at the gut wire to see where is the placement before you insert the tube inside. Uh, but as I said, it's not a must or mandatory to use it. It's a good practice. But if you don't have it, it's fine. Thank you, Dr. Fabian. Uh, there is still a question asking about the advantages of the uh, peritoneal dialysis, uh, whether it's only the preserving renal kidney uh, residual function or a sort of long-term mortality. Okay. Please, Dr. Lily, can you address this question? Um, sorry, come again. The question is on residual renal function. Sure. Uh, prefer, uh, why the, is the main reason of PD preferred than ST? Uh, is it just preserving uh, renal kidney uh, residual function or there is a short or long term mortality benefit? I think the advantages of the uh, PD. Yeah, so I think from my presentation just now, um, I mentioned the advantage of uh, PD. Uh, where it's a better option in terms of it preserves the residual function. So in patients who are still good urine output um, and uh, it tends to, uh, the patient have a less risk of fluid overload and we try to improve that urine output by giving uh, diuretics like fusamide, which is a loop diuretics and even uh, providing, prescribing them um, renin angiotensin inhibitor or ARBs where it has uh, evidence studies show that it preserves the residual function. And uh, please bear in mind that um, overhydration and um, preserving of uh, in patients who are anuric actually is an independent mortality uh, for patients on PD, um, where it can cause um, pulmonary edema, cardiovascular uh, death. So that's why in PD actually is a uh, residual function. Um, is very important where you don't tend to see this in hemodiasis patient. In hemodiasis patient, after two or three months, you tend to see them, they lose their residual function much faster. 
uh, much quicker. So that's why if possible in a patient who is planned for PD, we try to avoid the patient to be exposed to hemodialysis by using a catheter. So in certain centers for bridging the therapy before they're putting in uh, for the PD training, they will put a PD catheter uh, uh, using um, any methods, whether cell ginger or peritonoscopy, and they will be on intermittent PD before the proper training can be done. This is to avoid the patient being exposed to a dialysis a vascular excess, dialysis catheter, and exposing to hemodialysis. Thank you, Dr. Lili. I think we are approaching the end of the time. It's been almost two hours. We discussed about peritoneal dialysis, the Y2 PD, and the catheter insertion. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Lili, Dr. Fadlinla, and Dr. Rudy. Uh, before I close the session, I uh, will give uh, time for Dr. Scott Lipman, uh, Chairman of uh, Education Community of International, Socia International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, to give the closing remarks. Please, uh, Dr. Scott. Thank you, Dr. Pringo. I appreciate it. And um, on behalf of the ISPD, I definitely want to thank the Indonesian Society of Nephrology for this excellent collaboration. I look forward to two more webinars. Um, I would also like to thank all the attendees for sticking with us for an excellent session. I hope it was uh, as educational for you as it was for me. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers. Again, three excellent presentations to lay the foundations of why to choose PD and then how to get the catheter in. Future sessions will build on this in terms of actually doing the prescription and managing some of the infectious complications. That will be the next section, uh, the next session. So. Uh, unless there are any other comments by our panelists, I have the honor of closing the session and saying good night to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>